It was one of the best evangelistic centers in the greater metropolitan Boston area. It was owned and operated by a man named Bob. Bob came to be a believer in Jesus Christ early in his adult life and from that point on he discovered that his day-to-day -day life and his Christian life were one and the same. Bob was not a pastor. He was not a pastor of a mega church or a little church. Bob was not into TV ministry and he didn't run a program. Bob owned and operated an auto repair garage and gas station. You could never go there without waiting. People scheduled weeks in advance to get their car in. You see, Bob was upright, had integrity, character, and charged honest prices. Then when people commented on his honesty and fair prices or thanked him, he would use that opportunity to tell them, I am honest because God loved me and changed my life. And that simple little sentence often brought further conversations where he could invite them to his church and or even introduce them to Jesus. What a concept. It was a very unlikely place to help others. A quiet lawn with tombstones. When her husband died, Thelma was devastated. She began to go to the cemetery, often to connect with her dead husband. A Christian friend began to visit her and helped her to grieve rather than attempt to resurrect. Through that process, Thelma returned to dependence on the Lord, receiving comfort and peace. Then she discovered she could share God's love in the cemetery. Weekly, as she would tend her husband's grave, she would pray that God would send hurting people to that peaceful location. And it happened, of course. One after another, after another, after another, she would see them grieving at a graveside. And just by going over and saying hello, I'm sorry for your loss, and telling them about her own journey, God did the work. All she did was make herself available and tell what Jesus had done for her. There in that memorial park in Houston, Texas, she helped a number of people reach out to the Lord, reconnect with their church, or invited them to hers. What a concept! And to my knowledge, Thelma's the only graveyard evangelist I've ever heard of. You see, in our day-to-day -day lives, at our jobs, and in our homes, and at the hardware store, Starbucks, or anywhere, anywhere, by sharing our experience with the Lord, we are witnessing we are evangelizing. And when we do that, the Holy Spirit takes it from there. Romans chapter 8 opens with a clear message. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God has acted in the death and resurrection of Jesus to set those in the Roman church and us free from the law of sin and death. What is now at work in the life of all who are in Christ is the Spirit of God who dwells in us. Christ's death makes it possible for those who are in Him to live a life being led by the Spirit. 
No longer do we live in fear and bondage, but rather in the assurance that we are children of God, adopted by Him and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Romans 8, verse 17. Paul tells us that adoption as God's children does not mean that the Christian life will be free from pressure or heartache. But it is God's plan to liberate all creation from the destruction brought by sin. What awaits all things is final redemption and freedom. Romans 8 verse 23. This restoration of humanity to our true destiny will also mean the restoration of all creation. This is our ultimate hope. This earthly life we live, we do it with the full awareness that the Spirit helps us in all things. We are Spirit-dependent people. The earthly life we live, we do it confidently. All things work together for good for those who love God. Verse 28. Paul helps us understand that God's purpose for us is not just our initial salvation, but also our entire sanctification and our ultimate glorification. Verses 26 through 30. And nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God experienced in our lives now and forever. Maybe some of the greatest verses in all the Bible are found right here in Romans chapter 8. So here's what I'd like for you to do here in the sanctuary and out on the net. For the next moment or two, close your eyes. Don't go to sleep, but close your eyes and listen to these words. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. Know who you are, people of Jesus Christ. And only after this awesome word... Does Paul continue his letter? I think he probably took a break there and ran around the room, did a few loops, shouting, Hallelujah. And then he goes back to his letter. Romans chapter 9, he pens his profound concern for his own people, Israel, and explains his understanding of the gospel to the Jew first and then to the Greek. He explains that because the Jews placed their confidence in the law, they stumble over Jesus. He then continues the theme of righteousness that comes from God and affirms that Christ is the completion of the law. That Christ provides salvation for everyone who believes, Jew and Gentile, everyone. And these paragraphs in chapter 9 and first part of 10 bring us to the mission. Paul has taken up to 10 and almost 10 and a half chapters to get us to the point that we know who we are in Jesus. We can trust him. We can trust his love will never fail. Would you stand for the reading of God's word this morning? 
Romans 10 verses 14 and 15. I will be using the NIV this morning. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. We, you and I, all Christians are sent ones. The very last thing Jesus told his followers, not just the 12 disciples in Acts 1 and the Gospel of Matthew at the end was, you will be my witnesses, go. A witness is a sent one who tells, you know what a witness is, a witness in court. A witness is somebody that tells what they saw, what they heard, and or what they experienced. That's a witness. A witness tells the story of what happened to them and to others. Anyone who follows Jesus is a witness. We have something to tell about what God has done for us and or in us. And no story is boring or uneventful. How God has worked in your life, how God has worked in my life, how God's worked in Steve's life, how God works in Stacy's life, it's all different and it's all significant. What God is doing in you is significant every day, all the time. Every disciple has the very life of the Lord pulsing through us. We just looked at Romans 8. We are indwelt and led by the Spirit of the living God. We have been set free, released, forgiven, redeemed, made new, and are inhabited by Jesus. The Holy Spirit will even give us the right words to say. You see what the Lord just did? The Lord just took out every excuse any of us can think of as why not to be a witness. Paul's taken a whole lot of words, which he must be a pretty wordy guy, but he's just taken a whole lot of words, a whole lot of chapters, a whole lot of verses to get us to this point. All disciples are sent ones with something to share that can help others be free, saved, restored, and reconciled to the Lord. Which is evangelism. You realize that's what evangelism is. I have to admit, this morning as I sat um, by the front door, I do that in case someone comes in uh, during Sunday school time. I could hear pieces and parts of Jan's class. Can you believe I, Jan, Jan and I had not talked about what I was preaching and then we're in two totally different parts of the Bible. And it's the same message. Exact same theme. Exact same subject. God is speaking to us this morning. I hope you're listening. That's not a coincidence. God's at work among us. He's moving. He's doing things. Sharing the good news of our lives requires no strategy or programs. It is dependent upon responding to the Spirit's nudge to open our mouths and our hearts for the love of Jesus and the sake of others. Here we're looking at a letter to the Romans. Their church was about 30 years old at this point. They're no longer a new church plant. 
there's some conflict going on inside the church because members have different backgrounds and experiences. And Paul levels all that by saying, Jesus, salvation is for everyone. And all of you are sent ones. And what Paul does is call them to action here in verses 14 and 15. He says to them, tell how Jesus has saved you from paganism or the law or anything else. Tell your experiences or people cannot know. If you don't talk about what Jesus is doing in your life, people can't know. We must realize if we don't share, people will not hear. Or worse, they will hear from sources that are incorrect, misguided, or even from the pit of hell. Paul preaches the same message we see it in other letters of his book or in the book of Acts. And we note, we note if we look through at Paul's life, let me tell you, he does some really strange things. What he does is he takes his story and he fits it to that context. He fits it to where he's at and what's going on. He fits his story and the story of Jesus in his life. In Athens, Paul shares with philosophers and uses apologetics to witness. In Corinth, Paul lives with them. He moves in. He becomes a blue-collar worker for 18 months. just so he can present his story, his witness of what Jesus has done. In Jerusalem, Paul tells what he has seen the Holy Spirit do in the Gentiles to share his experience. And when on trial before Felix, a high government official in his day, Paul becomes a lawyer. And he shares in legal fashion. The point is, Paul did not necessarily have a formula for presenting Jesus. What he did was simply tell who Jesus was to him, what Jesus had done for him, what he had seen Jesus do in other people. And he did it in a way that the people he was around could understand it. He just shared what he saw and what he underwent. He was a witness. Now, lest I give you the wrong impression, formulas, programs, and strategies are and can be a useful tool. I don't want to negate those. They have been a useful tool to me. But not knowing a system or not thinking you might have the right words is never, never an excuse not to share Jesus and what Jesus is doing in our life. This love that God has given to us, a love we can never be separated from, a love that brings good out of bad, a love that puts the Spirit in us, that in itself compels us to share. It compels us to tell about it. It compels us to live it out. And you know what? Think about it. Just think about this for a minute. The church in Rome did it church in Rome did it. Where did the biggest church in the world end up? <laughs> in that day and time and then for 1,500 years. Think about it. 
they witnessed. They witnessed to what Jesus was doing in them, through them, around them, to others. They told about it. And the gospel is still spreading. And it's still spreading because all Christians are sent to tell what Jesus has done in our lives using words and deeds. Gas station guy. Gas station guy didn't start with, hey, do you know who Jesus is? Hey, do you know where you'd go tonight if you died? Hey, la la la. He started with being honest. He started with running an honest business. And then people would say, man, I really appreciate I can come here and you're honest. And he'd go, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. I've had people come to me and say, hey, man, I've really got a problem with this and this and this substance. And I go, let me tell you. I know what you're talking about. Let me tell you what Jesus did in me. People may come to you as all different things because we're all different. God is putting experiences in us and around us. They're all different. For us to share them. Regular people, like a gas station owner or a cemetery evangelist, or a school teacher, or a lineman, or a heavy machinery operator, or a chaplain, or a student, or a grandma, or a camping retiree, or a nurse, all of us just sharing, witnessing, telling about, telling about what Jesus has done in us, through us, around us. Living our lives so that our lives say, here's what Jesus has done in me, through me, and around me. Jesus has affected our lives. And when we reflect Jesus, which is what we're supposed to do according to Paul, when we reflect Jesus, it comes out in our conversations. And just getting real practical, if in my conversation I tell someone, hey, I, I, let me, I, I, this is what happened to me. I, I don't know about how, how that's going to work for you, but here's what happened for me. Once I finish with telling them how God has worked in my life, there is one more step. There is one more step. And the step is, so what do you think about that? Sometimes that's the step we miss. And when they say, well, here's, I don't know if I believe that or not, then there's a second step. It's real easy, and the second step is, well, let's talk more about that. Or, oh my goodness, how incredible would this be? Hey, I'll tell you what. I don't know if I can answer that question, but would you come to church with me? I, you can sit with me, and after church, we'll go have lunch. <gasps> Novel concept. Oh, my goodness. It's all about being the feet who bring good news. Ten and a half chapters, and Paul says, it's all about being the feet who bring good news. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for all that the Holy Spirit is forming in us as we've been looking at this letter to the Romans. Lord, we thank you for your living word. We thank you that you are in us, guiding and teaching us. We thank you, oh Jesus. We thank you so much that we have been rescued and restored and made whole. We thank you that nothing can separate us from your love. And now, Lord, oh now, Lord, hear our prayer. Have mercy. 
Christ, have mercy. May your Holy Spirit help us to realize you are calling us. You are speaking to us to be a witness of you. To tell people who you are and what you've done in our life. To share with them what you can do in their life. So Lord, we do, we, we humbly ask that in the very next opportunity that we get to be a witness, help us, Lord, to do it. Your word, right there, Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit will give you the words you need when you need them. Lord, help us not to worry about that. Help us just to share what you're doing in us. That's powerful. And Lord, we also ask, may your spirit go ahead of us and prepare hearts. Lord, we're around sometimes the same people every day. Lord, help us to ask for your favor upon them. Open their hearts to you. Oh God, we pray. And Lord, in all honesty, sometimes all the words we'll speak will just plant a seed that doesn't grow for years. Lord, help us not to be discouraged. Just help us to keep witnessing to who you are and what you're doing in our life. Help us keep telling about it and what you're doing in lives of people around us. Lord, all that's happened to Aaron has opened so many doors for me to be able to reach out to people with your love to share about you. All the experiences in my life, Lord, have given me hundreds of opportunities. Just the experience of camping in the same place year after year. Lord, help us. Help us to, to that to be on the forefront of our mind all the time. How can I witness about Jesus? How can I witness about all the good that he's doing in my life? We ask that by your power may every person that hears our witness have a seed planted or come to fruit right then or get watered or some process of coming to know you. And then, Lord, help them to begin sharing their story. Father, give us boldness to love others and tell them why. Lord, now we give you praise. We give you praise for loving us. We give you praise for trusting us. We give you praise for turning us loose with a witness about you. We praise you for enabling us and putting your words in our minds. And Lord, we just humbly thank you for the changes you've brought in us. The grace that pours over us all the time and the hope that we're filled with. Hope that we can give away. Hope that we can share. Lord, we love you because you first loved us and gave your life for us. Help us, Lord, to give our words for you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ushers will now come.